Thank you. So welcome, welcome, everyone. Zosel is visiting for the first time. Zosel, if you weren't here when I said, Zosel was my mentor when I first arrived in Second Life nine years ago. She was on another avatar, um, but totally saved me from wearing boxes and looking really, really bad. So welcome to you, Zosel. I do want to make a few announcements before we get underway. Up in the front, there's a place where you can click and get today's copies. And um, so make sure that you do that and bring them home and, and think about them during the week. And this week, I was sitting at the breakfast table. I've already talked to Luke about this. I was doing my Bible reading, and I was reading the verse in Revelations where it says that uh, the saints, meaning us, the ones who truly love God, um, overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And this verse just kept going through my head over and over and over again, the word of their testimony, the word of their testimony. And then I started watching testimonies on YouTube, people who have made videos about how they found God, away from religion, just them and God. People who have left witchcraft, people who have left Satanism, uh, cults, atheism, all kinds of things. People record their testimony. And I found that so interesting. Even Jewish people uh, just talking about how they started to read the scriptures and like all of a sudden it like hit them between their eyes and they were like, holy cow, you know, this stuff is true. And it, the, I just found the testimonies. Yes, I am second. Yes, 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 I am second. I was watching them too. And so I was sitting at the breakfast table having my coffee. And I just, look, I am so busy. You all know that. I am not looking for more work. So I know that this was not my idea. And I just heard like in my head this idea where it would be wonderful if avatars, we, the people that we are behind our avatars, make a video where we give our testimony. Each of us, look, I used to be an atheist. Uh, Hanua, you have your story that you told me. Um, you all have a story of how you found the Lord and what you've come out of. And Luke and I, I'm, I'm volunteering you, Luke. Uh, Luke and I would like to record you. So if this is something and we would like to put it on YouTube and we'd like to put, we'd like to, um, uh, well, we're going to do a podcast. That was the second, that was the second, um, announcement, but we want to record your testimony so that we can also post it to second life Facebook pages because if we recorded you in real life, that has nothing to do with Second Life, and we can't post it to Second Life pages on Facebook. But if it's your avatar giving the testimony, then we can do that. So if you are interested in doing that, why don't you start to make notes about your testimony, how you came to know God, what happened, how did God reach you? Because none of us found God. It was God who came looking for us. So if this is something you'd like to do, uh, let me or Luke know. And uh, we're just moving forward on this slowly. But if you're interested, we would love to record you. Thank you, Heaven, for that. Now, the other thing is, uh, nobody was coming to the was up at the coffee house on Wednesdays at noon. And Luke and I thought that it might be... Um, that time be better used for he and I to do a podcast. And our idea is to do a rational, logical podcast that is geared towards skeptics and also atheists. Because atheists really, truly, I know for me, they have not really thought through their position. They just say, well, I don't believe in God. But they haven't really thought they haven't really thought through that process because when you get them in conversation and they say, well, I believe in the big bang. And then you present them with the, uh, unmovable scientific law that you can't have an effect or a result 
without a cause. And so even if they believe in the Big Bang, you have to have the Big Banger or else their, their supposition, their theory falls apart. So Luke and I would like to have uh, do a podcast in conversational tone. And so that's the other thing that we're moving forward on. And uh, the, the third announcement that I have is that um, I hired a scripter to actually make us a nine-page book for a Bible track that is called Are You a Good Person? And it's the good person challenge, asking people to please take the good person challenge. And I really thought that this scripter was going to charge us a fortune because when you see the book, it's 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 incredibly done. Uh, the pages turn and, and uh, it, I just thought he was going to charge a fortune. And he said to me that uh, it's free because I gave him the idea and he did it and it gave him a beautiful uh, product for his store. So he gave it to us for free. And then I showed the Bible tract to Matarsi and Matarsi brought up a very, very good point. He said to me, who owns the artwork? And I said, well, um, Living Waters owns it. And I said, I can't use it. And he said, well, I don't know, Bray, you better check because if it's copyrighted, you could get in trouble. So I wrote to Living Waters and I asked them if I could use it. And they said, well, it's a free tract. It's out there on the internet for anyone to download and to use. So um, this week I will get the the um, actual artwork, the cartoon artwork into the book. And uh, you will all get a book so that you can give it out. We will have a kiosk in the coffee shop uh, that people can click on and take the good person challenge. So those are my announcements. Um, if you have any prayer requests, please drop them into the prayer request box. God answers prayer. Um, please keep Candy in your prayers. Uh, she has she has not been here because she's she has some real difficult real life challenges going on. So um, I'm not at liberty to say exactly what they are, but. Uh, Let's just say that my challenge with the woman upstairs is nothing compared to what Candy is going through. So please keep her in your prayers. So if you're ready, I am too. Lord, I just ask that your word would feed our soul and our spirit and that what you have to say to us today will change our lives just a little bit more and that you would bring us along in the process that you have us in changing us and, and making us more like you. And I, I just praise you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, beloved, we talked about praise. And we spoke about praise and how very important it is for us because we are made as creatures of praise. And this is absolutely obvious. When you see people at a music concert that they enjoy jumping up and screaming and their arms up in the air and yelling and screaming and enjoying it. They are praising the musicians. Standing ovations, even at a uh, a high nose concert where everybody is very prim and proper, they may not start to hoot and holler and scream and yell, but they'll stand up in a standing ovation and clap over and over and over and over again. That's a form of praise. You certainly see outward, uninhibited and joyous, boisterous examples of praise at football games. We as humans, we even have elaborate ceremonies of praise, like the Oscars or the Grammy Awards. We praise delicious food, we praise fragrant, fragrant, wonderful wine. We'll praise someone on their new hairstyle or their outfit. We praise and compliment things all day long without even realizing what we're doing. We are made, our creator made us as creatures of praise, praising or complimenting comes as natural to us as breathing. Even when these things are minor, 
We see beauty in everything. We'll stand before a sunset and say, oh, look at that sunset. That's so gorgeous. Or, oh, this song is so wonderful. The problem comes in when the objects of our praise are not in the proper order. They're not in the proper priorities. That's when things get out of whack. So today we're going to talk about the difference between praise and worship. We talked about praise last week. This week we're going to talk about worship, but as I want to say, worthship, and I'll explain that in a minute. Throughout the Bible, we are really told that we should praise God, that we should praise the Lord. It's we're told this so many times. It's just so many times to to uh, even mention. In Psalm 148, 1 to 10, all of creation is told to praise God, including the angels. In fact, they're commanded to give praise to God. Scripture even gives us specific ways to praise God. And I want to read this with you. Uh, Just zoom in. And I just want to read this with you before we go on. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. That's saying everything that is in heaven above should praise God. It says, praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded, he spoke, and they were created. That's the Big Bang. God spoke and boom, he created it. He established them forever and ever. He gave a word and it shall not pass away. What God says is going to happen in the Bible, beloved, is going to happen. There are over over 2,500 prophecies in the Bible and over 2,000 of these prophecies have come true historically 100% accuracy. For us not to think that the last 500 that has to do with the return of Jesus Christ to this earth and with the last days, if we think these are not going to come true, we're in delusion. God has given his word and it shall not pass away. It goes on to say, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. Everything. When you hear a bird singing, that bird is praising God. We're also told in God's word that there are different ways of praising God, like singing and shouting, dancing, musical instruments, and I've given you the the uh, references for that. We were made to praise God first and foremost, and then everything else. We learned last week how praise can really benefit us and draw us into a closer relationship with the Lord. For instance, when you look at a sunset, instead of saying, oh, what a pretty sunset, Instead, say, Lord, what a beautiful sunset you've made today, because the sky is never the same. Today, however, we're not going to talk about praise. I want to talk about worship, which is different than praise. And understanding the difference between praise and worship can bring a brand new depth to the way that we honor God in our life. So the word worship comes from an old Saxon word, which, which was worth-ship, meaning something we would assign a worth or value to God. Like if you think something is worth it, then you assign worth-ship to it. And of course, God is certainly worthy of, of being worthy of worth-ship. What exactly then is worship? Well, praise 
is the joyful recognition of all that God has done. Praise is closely intertwined with thanksgiving as we offer God back appreciation for the mighty things that he has done on our behalf. Uh, Praising God, wow, look at my hands so beautifully made. I can see, I can speak, I can think, I can walk. I, I have love in my life. I have food on my table. This is all praise. It's a thanksgiving. And praise is universal because it can be applied to other relationships as well. Just like I said earlier, we can praise our family, our friends, our boss, even the guy who comes to wash our car. We can praise him by saying, wow, what a really good job you did. That's great. Thank you so much. That's a form of praise. Praise does not require anything from us. It is just the truthful acknowledgement of the righteous acts of someone else. And since God has done so many unbelievably wonderful things, he is certainly worthy of praise. Worship, however, hello, Professor Tom Tom, welcome. Worship, however, comes from a very different place from inside of our spirits. Worship needs to be reserved for God alone. Jesus answered Satan when Satan took Jesus up to the temple and said, if you worship me, I will give you all the cities of the world because they've been given to me. Jesus answered him and said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and only him serve him only. Now, worship is the art of losing one's self in the adoration of another. Praise can be part of worship, but worship goes way beyond praise. Praise is easy. It's like a word party or a song party. It's celebratory. It's easy. Worship is not so easy. Worship really gets to the core of our heart, to the core of who we are. To truly worship God, we must let go of our self-worship. Now, before you say, oh, Bray, but I don't self-worship. We all do to some point. We get dressed, we look in the mirror, we're very concerned about how we look, what we wear. We take selfies. Uh, We never want to look bad in front of anybody. We we all have a taste of self-worship. Some people have it worse than others, but we all have it. And in order to truly worship God, we have to let go of our self-worship, which comes to us as naturally as breathing or eating. In worship, excuse me, in worship, we must be willing to humble ourselves before God and surrender every single part of our lives to his control. It comes down to understanding you are God and I am not. We must be willing to obey him, give him control over our life. Does that make us a robot? No, because that's freedom of choice. And in worship, we begin to adore him for who he is, not for what he has done. We praise him for what he has done, but we worship him for who he is. That is a huge difference. Worship is a 24-7 lifestyle. It's not just an occasional activity. Jesus said to the woman at the well that the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, when you look at scripture, praise is usually presented as boisterous, joyful, uninhibited, 
David even danced before God in his underwear. Do you remember that? God wants praise from all of his creation. On Palm Sunday, if you remember this, and we'll be talking about this because next Wednesday is um, the beginning of Lent. As uh, biblical believers, we don't actually celebrate Lent, but we do recognize um, the, the time, right? So when Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the people started praising him and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to blessed is the Lord. The Jewish priests at that point told Jesus to tell the people to be quiet. But Jesus answered that if the people didn't praise God, that even the stones would cry out. Praise is joyous and celebratory and exuberant. But when the Bible mentions worship, the tone changes. We read verses like, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Come, let us worship the Lord and bow down. Just as praise is intertwined with thanksgiving, worship is intertwined with surrender. Praise goes with thanksgiving. Worship goes with surrender. Very often, worship is coupled with the act of bowing or kneeling. And these positions show humility and contrition. The physical acts or the physical positions that are associated with worship such as the bowing and kneeling that I mentioned, also lifting one's hands, help to create that necessary attitude of humility that's required for real worship. It is through true worship that we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us, convict us, teach us, correct us, and comfort us. Through worship, we are able to realign our priorities with God and acknowledge him once more as the rightful Lord and master of our lives. And by the way, everyone, I should mention this, that um, I've gotten a lot of IMs, people asking me, about the Ukraine invasion by Russia, if this is part of prophecy. Um, the 38th and 38th, 39th chapter of Ezekiel does not mention that Russia is going to invade Ukraine, but it does mention that Russia will eventually um, invade Israel. And by taking over the Ukraine, they are adding to their power. They are getting a, a more geographical a strategic position. And so this is not a specific prophecy that's being fulfilled, but rather a step towards the other prophecy being fulfilled. It's just one step closer to the return of Jesus Christ. So if you have any more questions about that with what's going on, please let me know and get in my IM. So God has exalted uh, you know, Jesus was a spirit and he was the son with the father. But once he came to earth and he took on a human body, he now has that human body. He went back to heaven with his human body. So the part of God that was the son is now forever in a glorified body. He can't just like dump it. It's glorified. But when we get to heaven, we're going to see the scars on his hands and the scar in his side. He's got that body. And why do we worship? You know, there's a day when every single knee will bow before Jesus Christ and every single tongue will confess that he is God, Lord, and Savior. If you look at this verse in Philippians, it talks about that the son became man, set aside his glory, 
and became obedient even to the cross. That's what comes before this verse. And then this verse says, so therefore, because of these things, that that Jesus became obedient even to the cross, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is amazing. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Beloved, this means that every atheist, every Satanist, the proud, the haughty, the witch, the wicker, the skeptic, Every single person that has denied Christ will have their knee bowed and their tongue confessing that he is Lord and Savior. The difference will be that our knee bowed and our tongue confessing will be a joyous celebration of welcome, Lord, finally. Thank you, Jesus. And there tongue confessing and their knee bowing will be with fear, terror, dread, regret, sorrow, remorse, and anguish, but it will be too late. Only God Almighty deserves our worship. We can give praise to other people, but worship belongs only to the Lord. Only to the Lord should we bow Only God Almighty deserves our worship. So why do we worship God? Well, the first reason is that we worship God because he is the creator. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, John, God gave John a vision of God seated on his throne in heaven. And surrounding the throne are four living creatures and 24 elders. And they are worshiping God saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will, they exist and were created. They are exclaiming and proclaiming that God is worthy of our worship because he created everything. All living things have their being in him. It is our breath in our lungs. We die the moment that God takes that breath away. He's in control of that breath. We also worship God because he is Lord and master. You know, the word Lord is kind of foreign to us. It's not really used much in our world today, at least not in the West. But it was a very widely used term in biblical days. You find it in the Bible mostly referring to God but it was also used for a sovereign, like a king or a master. It really is the one who is in charge. And this is a great description for God because he is the sovereign Lord, the master of everything, the ruler of heaven and earth. And as such, he is worthy of our worship. Woe to the people, woe to the people who call another human being Lord or master, and yet they refuse to give that surrender to their creator. And an even greater woe to those who accept worship that is not rightfully theirs and that worship belongs to God alone. Woe to the people who allow other people to kneel before them. 
Woe to the people who allow people to bow down to them or kiss their hand or kiss their ring as an act of worship. Woe to those who call another human being master and woe to those who who call themselves masters and have slaves and other things, uh, pets and woe to them. Worship belongs to God and to God alone. Our worship should not go to any human being, not even a human being who's called saint. Our worship should not go to angels. Our worship should not go to Mary, the woman who bore Jesus. Our worship cannot go to anything or anyone except the Lord God Almighty. That is the commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God. The glory and the honor is mine, he says. We also worship God because he is our redeemer. God is worthy of my worship because he is my creator and my Lord. He, but he's much more than just that. Throughout the pages of the Bible, you will find him historically working over and over and over again to call people to himself. And more personally, he called me to himself. If you think about your conversion, you probably didn't go looking for God. God used different people or different circumstances or different situations or different conversations or maybe somebody giving you a New Testament or somebody inviting you to church. God used different things to call you to himself. I am a sinful human. I make mistakes. I fail. I hope to be continually learning and, and, and changing and being changed. But I was separated at one time completely from the love of God because of my sin. But God provided a suitable sacrifice for my sin. And he took my sinfulness and instead gave me the righteousness of Christ. And then adopted me into his family. And he has prepared an eternal future for me with him. And why did he do all that? It certainly wasn't for anything that I've done. I didn't earn it. It was simply because he is my creator and he loves me. And as my creator and your creator also, God is indeed worthy of our worship. But how much more worthy of our worship is he because he is also our redeemer, merciful and forgiving God and heavenly father. The next reason that we worship God is because, well, he's worthy. In the end, everyone will bow before God. If you've had a conversation with someone lately where they tell you, well, I don't believe in God, you know, you just got to think to yourself, well, you don't now, but you will one day because you will be down on your knees confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because that's what it says. Everyone is going to bow before God and worship him as Lord. Believers and non-believers. And they will worship God and 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 proclaim that he is Lord, and then they will be sent off to live in eternity exactly how they live their life, without God. However, when we believers all stand before him, his glory and his majesty will so overwhelm us that we will bow and dance, not because we're forced to, not because some religion is telling us to, but simply because we acknowledge that he's worthy of our worship. 
how much better for us that we are worshiping him now. He is our creator, our Lord, our redeemer. Our natural response to him should be to mimic the elders in this passage that you see before you and say, holy, holy, holy are you. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive all honor and power. So how do we worship? Well, Romans 12 verse 1 gives us a very good basis for worship. And this says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because of God and his mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That is the first form of worship to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. The sacrifices of the Bible are kind of foreign to us, but the sacrifices of the Bible were always an animal, usually a lamb. And it was usually the lamb that was killed and then burnt. And the animal was killed to first demonstrate the seriousness of sin and to have a visible example of what God said the law is. The law is, if you sin, you shall surely die. And so the animal was killed as a visual example of that. And the animal symbolically took the punishment of death in place of the person whose sins were then forgiven by the shedding of that animal's blood. Orthodox Jews in Israel are flipping out to have the third temple. They are so hot to go for the next temple. They've got all the instruments ready. They've got all the high priests trained. They are so wanting that temple. Why? Because since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, they know that there have been no animal sacrifices and there has been no forgiveness of sin since the temple was destroyed. That's why they're, they're, they want that third temple so badly. The Jews now, they go to the river and they throw bread on the water and the bread is supposed to take away their sins. God never said that. That's something invented by the rabbis. And clearly in Leviticus, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so this, the, the death of the animals, by substitution, the animal died instead of the person. And God did this this whole system of animal sacrifices, God did this to give us an example of the sacrifice that one day would be Jesus on the cross, the Lamb of God, who by his shed blood takes away our sin. Now, since the cross, God doesn't want dead animal sacrifices. That's why he had the temple destroyed in Jerusalem. What he wants now is us as a living, breathing sacrifice given to him 24-7. And we are told that this is our true and proper worship. It is complete surrender, 100% submission, the deepest respect, adoration, and love. It is giving our lives to service to the Lord and master of the universe. Does this mean that everyone has to be an evangelist? Does this mean that every one of you has to go be a preaching pastor? No, but it does mean, it does mean, hmm. 
It does mean that you submit to God where you are living. It means that you submit to God and you accept what God has you doing. It means not complaining about what you don't have or where you can't go. You taking care of your elderly parents is an act of worship. You caring for a sick or disabled spouse or a sick or disabled child and doing it joyously is an act of worship. Living with far less money than we would like is an act of worship. God has each of us, and this is hard to swallow sometimes, God has each of us exactly where and how he chooses us to be. Accepting that is an act of worship. Does that come overnight? No, it's a process for all of us. God has each of us where and how he chooses Accepting that is an act of worship. Is this easy? No. And that's why it's called a sacrifice of worship. Remember I said earlier, praise is easy. Worship is not. When God wants to change our lives, our finances, or our circumstances, he will. Worship also requires energy and effort, especially during those times when you really don't feel like it. It requires effort because it, you have to do what you don't feel like doing. And if you're grumbling and complaining about it, then it's not worship. But if you have a cheerful heart about it, then it becomes worship. We can either grumble and pout sulk and complain, or we can turn what we don't like into an act of worship. Worship is also living. It's a lifestyle. Worship is how we live and the attitude that we carry while we do it. Worship is our lifestyle. It's our daily deliberate choices. It's how we dress, how we speak, how we present ourselves to the world. We were all created to glorify God. And so that everything we do should do exactly that. Glorify God. So then the question is, where should we worship? Well, tradition, religious tradition, tells us that there is a specific time and a place for worship. For most, that tradition says that it's on Sundays. For Jews, it's from Friday night to Saturday night. We worship here in Fellowship Field. However, tradition isn't always the whole truth. Real worship is much more than a Sunday or a Saturday experience. Worship should occur in a Christian's life throughout the whole day in a variety of ways. The first kind of worship we have is devotion. That's a time of learning. This is your Bible reading or your Bible listening, letting God speak to you, change you, teach you. Prayer is also a form of worship, but it's not, it's, it's really thanking and requesting. It's not really worship. This is the time that we go to our father with our needs and our thanks. So while we're asking God for something, that's really not worship. That's prayer. But then we have worship. This is a time of adoring, honoring, 
singing to the Lord, bowing our hearts before him, not asking him to do anything, just worshiping him for who he is. Another way that we can worship God is through tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings is a time of giving and sharing. Now, I don't stress this, but the Bible is very clear in the book of Malachi that God feels that 10% of what we get really belongs to him. Now, you can give him 10% of money. You can also tithe time and effort. There are many ways to tithe. I am not so legalistic that I feel that uh, 10% is always money because time is also money. There are many ways of giving. Here in Fellowship Field, thankfully, I'm grateful to God that our financial needs are very few. We don't have a pastor's salary that we have to pay. The only thing that we really have to pay is our tier. And we also have to pay for the visual uploads of the teaching boards every week. And and there are other occasional low expenses. But thankfully, all of you cover that. And thank you very much to those of you who always remember that. And I always have uh, money that I'm able to pay tier. And I always have money for uploads. So I'm very grateful for that. But all of you have many more ways to give. And you have much more tithing that you really need to be doing in real life. You can support some mission. You can give to a gospel outreach. No, the scripture of the book, well, the scripture of the book gave me the book for free. I really, I think he's selling it for like almost 5,000 Linden. And I really thought that he was going to charge me like some outrageous amount like maybe five or ten thousand because it took him three months to do the scripting on it wait till you see it but he gave it to me praise god but there are many ways that you guys can tithe to um to as a form of worship to god you can like i said you can contribute to a soup kitchen you can make Comfort bags for the homeless, you know, you put in some uh, hand cream and a razor and a pair of socks and deodorant and, and, and there's so many things. You can send groceries to a struggling family or some elderly or disabled person on a fixed income. I have to be honest with you guys. We really were scrambling during these months without that rent coming in. And God put it in some people's heart to come to me and give me a, a contribution, a donation. We had Christmas and New Year's dinner because of a donation from somebody. And another week, we bought groceries because of a donation of somebody else. So those people tithe to God. I'm grateful because I was the recipient you can read to the blind in real life. Absolutely. Visit a nursing home. And I don't know how things are in the States with COVID, but um, you can offer to run errands for someone who can't. You can offer to clean their house, mow their lawn, shovel their snow, babysit for some poor ragged mother who's just about to go out of her mind so she gets some time to herself. Be creative. God will show you where you are needed if you are open and willing. And all of these things are worship. Every time I counsel someone, I spend hours with someone because they need they need some support, they need counseling. I do this in real life too. I don't charge. I never charge for teaching or for counseling. This is all worship. God will show you where you are needed. 
Ministry also is a form of worship. When we are actively building God's kingdom, we are worshiping God. You may not be an evangelist, and you maybe will never go to Bible college and become a pastor. But every time that you speak about Jesus to someone, every time you share the gospel, you are in ministry and you are helping to build God's kingdom. This is worship. The next thing that I want to say about worship is that worship is deliberate. We need to make worship intentional. When we make time for Jesus, we should do it with purpose, intention to glorify him, worship him, and bless him. Think of songs that you enjoy and ways that you can express your affection towards God and do it. Don't sing a song because you can sing well and don't not sing because you don't sing well. You aren't singing for America's Got Talent. You are singing your heart to the Lord. And you don't sing a song because it's a cool tune or you like the beat. And you don't raise your hands because everybody else is raising theirs. Whatever you do in worship, do it intentionally to show God his worth to you and nothing else. Spend time in, in your alone time. Raise up your hands in, 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 in that position to say, Lord, I just worship you. When you do that, I promise you, you're going to feel something in your spirit. Deliberate worship is also time. Time is very precious. And I want to ask you this morning, do you have time? Is there room in your busy schedule for Jesus? Do you actually set a time aside for the Lord or is he the last one on your list? Do you just fit him in if you remember and there's time? If you schedule a friend, if you schedule a call, if you schedule an appointment, then surely The Lord God Almighty deserves a time slot in your agenda. Amen. Worship is also spiritual. True worship takes place in the spiritual realm. It's your spirit reaching out, connecting with the spirit of God. It's not the place. And it's not the method that's important. It's the condition of your heart. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter what song we're singing. It doesn't matter what we sound like when we sing or when we play an instrument. It is simply allowing our spirit to communicate with God on a higher level a spiritual level. Worship, and this part is so important, beloved. This part is so important, what's coming up. Worship is sacrifice. Remember that I said to you that the one, the, um, that worse, that praise is easy and worship is not. Worship is sacrifice. Worship will always cost you something. It will cost you time, effort, money, lifestyle change. Worship will cost you vanity or pride. Worship 
might even embarrass you. It's humbling to display our worship. It's humbling to get on our knees before God. It is humbling to lift our hands and bow our head. Even if we are alone and no one is around, for many of us, that feels strange. Worship, so important. So in closing, there is a woman in the Bible who came into the place where Jesus was having dinner with many people. The Pharisees were there. The, the apostles were there. Guests were there. And this woman came into the place where Jesus was having dinner with these people. And she knelt down at the feet of Jesus in worship. And she poured a whole vial of fragrant oil over his feet. This perfumed oil was very expensive. In fact, the Bible tells us that it cost 300 denarii. And just to give you an idea of how much money that was, an agricultural worker in biblical times got paid one denarii for a full day's work. So the cost of that perfume, which was 300 denarii, cost 300 days salary. Her worship cost her something. Her worship also cost more than just money. She publicly worshipped, got down on her knees over the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. She didn't care who else was there. She didn't care who was looking or what they thought of her. She was there to worship Jesus. Now today, beloved, I want to tell you that each of us symbolically, we all have a vial of fragrant oil that we can pour out as worship. We all have something we can offer the Lord as act of worship. Even if it's for you to tell the Lord, I'm willing, please use me. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your life. He knows your struggles. He knows your challenges. He knows everything about you, your limitations. He also knows the gifts that he has given you. I'm waiting for gifts to start to blossom in this fellowship. We have a whole grid of unsaved people. Today might be the day that you say, okay, Lord, send me. I don't know what you're going to have me do, but I'm willing. That's an act of worship. So right now, I have two closing songs for you. And these are just not songs just for you to sing just because they're songs. I would like you to use these two songs for you to pour out your heart in worship. You're there in your home. You're alone. Nobody's going to be staring at you. Nobody's going to be looking at you. You have the you have the privilege of having privacy. Pour out your heart in worship with these two tunes, these two songs. Orf, offer to the Lord that which you have never given. Lose yourself in these songs. Lose yourself in worship with him and adoration like you never have done before. Bring yourself to another level. And I pray that in Jesus' name, that may God bless this word in all of our lives. And may you truly feel the presence of the Lord as you enter into worship. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.